I think we should probably get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to this session on, um, on external shocks, monetary policy, and financial stability. We have three papers, uh, three discussants. And uh, we'll start with a paper uh, that I co-authored with uh, two colleagues at, at the IMF on exchange rate swings and foreign exchange intervention. All right, so the issue of, um, well, this is the usual disclaimer. Um, these are not my, uh, these are my personal views, not those of necessarily of the IMF. The issue of the effectiveness of FX intervention has been a long-standing issue in international economics. And um, it, it is still subject uh, to an ongoing debate. Um, and uh, empirically, in terms of assessing the effectiveness of intervention, one problem is endogeneity. Uh, that's not the only problem. But, uh, you know, the, but one issue is that you know, the central banks tend, tend to, for example, um, uh, intervene in terms of leaning against the wind, right? When the uh, currency is appreciating, they tend to sell FX. And so you, you tend to observe a correlation, you know, say with an uh, appreciating domestic currency uh, and intervention that, that goes in, in the wrong way, right? You, you tend to find that it's not effective. And uh, so empirically, uh, researchers have tried to address this issue by focusing on shorter and shorter uh, horizons and looking at very short-term uh, effects of interventions, minute-by-minute minute data even. And, and this is, you know, of course, interesting in terms of technically identifying the effects, but it's not really policy relevant because policymakers don't really care about the minute uh, effect, but about longer, medium-term, or, or at least, you know, somewhat longer-term uh, impacts. And um, there are some studies that point to more persistent effects, but these are very few. So we are going in that direction. So we, we, we took on the kind of uh, uh, difficult task to, to find uh, or to, to see whether we could find any effects at, at the quarterly uh, horizon. So very long in, in the literature in, in that sense. And um, what we uh, do is, uh, is to, to look at different cycle uh, you know, frequencies, right? So a cycle-specific exchange rate misalignment. The notion is that you know, the relationship between exchange rates and fundamentals may be different at different cycle lengths. So long-term swings in exchange rate may be driven by long-term swings in fundamental, fundamentals in different ways than short-term swings may be driven by fundamentals, okay? And so what we proceed in, in four steps. We first specify the cycle length that we have in mind by, by using a common technique. Then we use spectral uh, regression methods to estimate uh, the relationship between the exchange rate and fundamentals. We use very standard fundamentals, but we look at different uh, cycles for 30 advanced and uh, uh, emerging market economies. And then uh, we derive the exchange rate misalignments, uh, but for, for each cycle. And then examine the effectiveness of FX intervention vis-a-vis uh, -vis misalignments at these different uh, cycles. Moreover, to address endogeneity concerns, we employ measure of policy surprises. So we, we estimate policy rules for FX interventions and uh, use deviations from these policy rules as surprises to get at that somewhat more exogenous measure of FX intervention. We also use a different um, instrument that I will allude to later. So this is, you know, I, I don't have time to go to the literature, uh, but, but it relates in various ways to the existing literature on real exchange rates. And so our main result is that we do find some support for effectiveness of FX interventions, even at this low, uh, even at measured at, at these 
policy relevant uh, frequencies of uh, quarterly, with quarterly data, but the intervention is really only effective vis-a-vis uh, -vis short term misalignment uh, and not vis-a-vis -vis medium and longer term misalignment. Um, and uh, for, for short term misalignment, a, a one point one percentage point percentage point of GDP exchange rate intervention is associated with a statistically significant uh, percent exchange rate of 1.5 1, 1 to 4.5%. Um, moreover, we find that more persistent and one-sided interventions are more effective and that FX interventions, not surprisingly, are more effective in less liquid markets. So, so that's really, in a nutshell, what, what it is all about. Uh, let, let me give you a few more details. Um, so we are interested in the usual relationship between exchange rates and fundamentals. Uh, we use uh, some of the typical suspects here, uh, per capita income, net foreign assets, openness, government consumption, terms of trade. So we, we really don't deviate here from, from the literature. Um, but we use, uh, we look at, at this relationship at different frequency bands, to, meaning short term, medium term, and long term cycles. And so how do we, what, how do we choose these cycle lengths? Well, we use um, a, a statistical algorithm that's based on, on the, the well-known work of Bry and Boshan, uh, and subsequently also used by Albuquerque and others. Uh, where we uh, really use a simple statistical te technique to, to look at turning points. Um, and we find that uh, long-run long run cycles, we call those of more than 10 years in duration, medium-term cycles are those of four or more years in duration, and short-term cycles are those of one to, two, four, one to four years. We don't really look at shorter cycles below one year. And uh, as mentioned, we estimate the equilibrium exchange rate not with regular methods, but with the band spectrum regression methods uh, for these different cycles. Uh, so th this basically entails transforming all the variables to a frequency a domain uh, using a Fourier transform and then using standard regression on those transformed variables for each frequency band. Quick word about the data. We start with 30 advanced and emerging market economies uh, covering the period 1990 to 2018. Mostly in the regressions, the sample is reduced to 26 countries due to data availability, but for the initial uh, assessments of cycles, we use 30 countries. Uh, we use exchange rate intervention proxies because these data are typically not available uh, in, in a very accurate uh, form. So we use a proxy that's based on a change of reserves adjusted for valuation. And um, for the exchange rates, we use, we use both real effective exchange rates weighted by trade baskets and uh, real bilaterally the exchange rates relative to the US dollar. So this is what, what, the, what the cycles uh, look like that, that I was talking about. So two examples. So here's Australia, and you see the actual, uh, it's a dotted line, and then the long cycle is, is, is moves like this, and the, the medium cycle and the short cycle are, are much closer to the, to the actual. Um, so, what do we get in the uh, initial uh, baseline estimation? Uh, so we find that these uh, fundamentals matter as found so far in, in the literature. They matter somewhat more in line with what we would have expected, somewhat more for the long cycles. So for the long cycles, we get a slightly higher explanatory power, uh, we get uh, some more significance for some of the variables. Uh, the difference is not huge, but, but it's there. Um, and uh, so this is, the results are, are 
you know, in terms of qualitatively their standard, but, but this is the differentiation between the short, medium, and long-term cycles that, that we make here. So um, based with these estimates of the equilibrium exchange rates at different frequencies, we then derive our misalignment, right? The misalignment vis-a-vis -vis these, uh, these uh, uh, equilibrium exchange rate at uh, each uh, cycle. And, um, and those misalignments we use in the estimations of the effectiveness uh, of uh, FX interventions because we really are also interested whether, you know, whether the, the effectiveness of intervention depends on the degree of misalignments. And, and if so, if it depends on the, the, the misalignment vis-a-vis -vis different cycles. So, uh, so this is our starting point for the estimation of the effectiveness of intervention, uh, where we have the ex log of the real effective exchange rate uh, as a dependent variable, then we have fundamentals, and, and then we use the FX intervention variable and interact it with the misalignment proxy uh, for each cycle. So the, this is, uh, uh, the, the, these are measures of the this misalignment as explained earlier at, at different uh, cycles. And um, we also include as, you know, a set of policy variables, additional short-term policy variables and global factors, which is debatable. We could leave them out, but we include them here in, in this uh, baseline. Um, uh, estimation. And uh, I was mentioning that we use a, a deviation from a policy rule to address the endogeneity of uh, FX intervention. And we, we use a, a rule that was estimated in, in another paper um, that is a, it, where FX intervention is modeled as a linear function of the volatility of the real exchange rate set of fundamentals, country fixed effects, and um, so we use the, the residuals of that estimated policy um, uh, rule as surprises. Um, it is one way of, of, of getting at the endogeneity problem. It's certainly not perfect, but it's, it's one approach. In an alternative approach, we also use uh, a, a variable, an instrumental variable that Blanchard and others have employed in a paper where they use capital flows to uh, other countries, other countries than the country in question, as, as an instrument um, uh, for, for exchange rate intervention. So, and the results are, are qualitatively similar. So what do we get? So we... Um, we focus here on, 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 this, um, on, on these lines here. Um, interestingly, so if, if you start with the simple FX intervention uh, coefficient here, it's, it's positive, right? Statistically positive. This is what you typically, typically get because of the endogeneity, the reverse causality problem, right? So that's not surprising. When we, con when we use the, the uh, correction for endogeneity, when we use our FX I surprises, the sign re reverses. So that shows that, you know, or suggests at least that our, our approach uh, is useful in addressing the endogeneity problem. When it comes to the interaction terms of FX intervention with the misalignment at different cycles, we find that uh, the, it is negatively and significant for short deviations from the short-term cycle, not for the others. So, and that's consistent across uh, both methods even when we use you know, the, the, the standard and, and the, the method that it corrects or addresses uh, endogeneity concerns. And, um, as expected, we get a higher coefficient, a, more, a, a larger negative 
coefficient um, in the method where we use policy surprises because we, we mitigate the att attenuation problem. Uh, and so uh, here, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we get a 1.5 1 approximately percentage uh, percent uh, effect on the exchange rate and here a 4.5% uh, uh, and this is this is so this is roughly you know with, with the interaction terms you always have to be careful how you how you interpret them but this is for a 10% de deviation from them from the uh, estimated equilibrium this is roughly the magnitude that we get um, now another question that we ask is whether um, there is a persistence, whether persistent intervention is somewhat more effective, right? So the notion is that if, if you intervene more, 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 uh, more repeatedly in, in a, a more repeated manner, whether that yeah, provides some sort of signaling or, or, or credibility uh, so that, uh, that uh, your, your next intervention may be more effective uh, than otherwise. And so we include another term here uh, that is the cumulative intervention over the past quarter and uh, provide another, inter uh, another um, interaction term uh, where, we, where we include this cumulative inter intervention um, variable. And we do find that uh, indeed uh, the, uh, there is some evidence that cumulative intervention is more effective, um, but uh, so we, we don't see the effect showing up you know, in, in different forms for different misalignments, but overall there seems to be some evidence that you know, any intervention that's preceded by continued intervention is somewhat more, more effective. Um, Lastly, we also look at uh, market liquidity, right? If you, if you have very deep, very liquid market, you know, there, there are few channels through which EVEX intervention uh, is likely to work, right? The central bank is just one player uh, and, and it shouldn't have much of, a, of, a, of an effect. You could think of some signaling effects, but in principle, you would expect FX intervention to be much less uh, uh, less effective in, in very liquid markets. Okay. And this is what we look at here, and we use a proxy for liquidity, um, the, the bid as spread in the, in the FX market. And uh, uh, we confirm the notion uh, that, that uh, the higher the spread, the more, uh, the more effective uh, intervention. But, but overall, in, in all these regressions, we always find the same kind of interaction with the short-term misalignment. So, so there's something special uh, about, about that, that misalignment vis-a-vis -vis to the one to four year cycles uh, that uh, makes intervention more effective. And uh, yeah, let me sum up again. Uh, we offer a new approach to addressing, to investigating the issue of FX intervention. Um, and uh, we use quarterly data, that is we focus on a policy relevant horizon. Uh, we find that leaning against the wind uh, can be effective, but only if vis-a-vis uh, uh, short, relatively short-term misalignments. So central banks cannot stem against you know, these long-term real exchange rate cycles that are driven really by, by, um, by fundamentals. And um, there is some evidence that persistent interventions are more effective. Uh, I have not shown it here, but we also look at sales versus purchases, and we find that sales are tend to be more effective than uh, purchases. And as expected, FX intervention is more effective in less liquid markets. Thank you. OK. Um, thank, you. thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks, thanks to the authors and to the organizers who invited me to commend this interesting paper.
Uh, I don't have to give a disclaimer anymore, but I still have this personal disclaimer thing. I used to work for the Central Bank of Peru. I, was, I used to be a, a deputy uh, uh, manager of monetary policy. So I used to be one of these guys intervening every day in the, in the committee and deciding on this intervention. So to me, it's very important, this paper, in the sense that it gives us a better explanation on when and, and how FX intervention works. But in a nutshell, what the authors do is they exploit these band spectrum regression methods to construct these cycle-specific bilateral real exchange rate misalignments for a set of countries. And in the second step, the outflows run a regression on the exchange rate using these cycle-specific misalignments. Um, the authors then perform a very robust uh, set of exercises, including, as Gaston already presented, the uh, uh, use of surprises, the cumulative effects intervention, uh, first differences, and a set of uh, really interesting, um, and actually very based in the theory behind this. Um, why do you, will you do these exercises? So the results is that FS intervention works, which is a relief for us, <laughs> for the people at the Central Bank of Peru. And actually it's more effective, according to this paper, on the um, short cycle, which is um, a one to four year cycle misalignments. And these results, as I mentioned, are very robust to all the different specifications that the authors follow. Just as, as, general, as a general consideration, I think this is a very challenging subject. And the reason why we have not been very um, uh, consistent with the results on these papers is because the, the tool of FX intervention is a complicated tool. Because central banks, different central banks use it for different purposes simultaneously, right? We have like at least in the service that the VIS um, um, uh, execute, they always mention five or six different uh, reasons for intervention, and this change in the frequency every time they survey. So, and also implementation and environment matters, right? We have sterilized versus non-sterilized. We have pre-announced pre -announced versus surprise interventions, dollarization in the terms that uh, in Peru, for instance, we have high degrees of financial dollarization, so a lot of these named foreign assets come from uh, actually um, reserve requirements that we demand on the banks. So this matters for us as well because we are worried about balance sheet effects. And then this very inter interesting interaction with monetary policy and the choice of the instrument between spot intervention or derivatives, of course, matters as well. And, and on top of that, intervention operates through very different channels. Right? You have the portfolio channel, the signaling channel, the expectation channel, and the liquidity channel. We treat a little bit of this uh, um, different channels on this paper with uh, my co-author, Adrian Armas. Um, and uh, Vitalia actually is a really valuable um, so resource to understand all of these channels of work. Um, just bear with me a, a little bit with this. This is a, um, if you take a small open economy, Neokinesian DSGE with market segmentation, as, it, as, as in this Hockey Mookin, and a paper that we're working with, Carlos Montoro, you can actually obtain this uh, very neat um, um, approximation to the welfare function. And this is interesting because there's a lot of things going on here. First, the most important thing to me, this is the usually Galimo Nacelli terms you have. This is a, a measure of the Bacchus Smith wedge, which measures a little bit of these frictions that are behind the reasoning for intervention. But to me, the interesting part on this result, which is shared with our authors, of course, is that there's two types of intervention actually going on here. The first one, I call it the evil intervention, which is the one that you use to actually manipulate your, your, the level of your exchange rate to actually make your country accumulate or decumulate made foreign assets, right? So this misalignment, I think, is the one that the IMF has always been worried about. And it's kind of like the old school uh, reason for intervention. But then the, these papers actually have a new reason for intervention, which is related to these non-fundamental shocks. And the channel of work here will involve many different um, uh, elements like the, how, how a liquid the market is or the risk capacity of these financial intermediaries and the volatility of exchange rate itself, which is a measurement of how risky or how much compensation I will ask for holding a long or a short position if I'm an, inter an intermediary. So what I'm trying to say is that um, I think the reason, in, the reason why it's hard to grasp this FX intervention and we have these different, these changes in why it's well regarded or bad regarded in the past is because we failed to make this difference before between good intervention and bad intervention. So we're trying to correct these misalignments caused by international financial market frictions. This actually is well for improving. But this one has completely different uh, 
um, reasoning, uh, different reasoning behind, different objectives behind. And I think this is a bad one, right? So we have always been trying to convince uh, everybody from the Central Bank of Peru, we're trying to do this one. And we're actually trying to reduce the volatility of uh, the exchange rate as a purpose in itself, because in a way, this um, reduces the misalignments of exchange rate with the fundamentals. But I need to talk about this also, about the fundamentals. And this is one of the points I want to address on the paper. The paper uses fundamentals, these kind of uh, beer or fear tradition variables that uh, this, the IMF is very familiar with. And I think here, there are a couple of things I, will, I would like to, to comment on. Like the measurements of the um, of uh, trade openness, I think there's some interesting uh, proposed alternatives, like one that Pritchett that kind of corrects for the area of the country and the landlockedness to actually try to improve on this. I don't know if they, you use this in the, the paper. And there's a second one that actually tries to control for purchasing power parity to account for the presence of non-tradables in, uh, in the economy. So I think these could be improvements on the measurements or robustness tests for the measurements of, of uh, trade openness. I, I want to make a point also in terms of, I think the reasoning between, be, behind using terms of trade as a proxy or, or something that correlates with a fundamental exchange rate, I think it itself is a tricky question because I think the reason why we uh, relate the fundamental exchange rate with these terms of trade has, is, is hiding in a way um, but international risk diversification. Like uh, when you have these sorts of trade shocks, since your country is badly diversified, you have a, a massive wealth effect that pushes exchange rate. But I don't know if this is actually fundamental. And if the central bank can help through FX intervention, I think uh, there's a space here to not think of this as a fundamental, but as non-fundamental part of the exchange rate. Um, then in terms of the FX intervention proxy in Adler, they actually introduced derivatives, which is very interesting in this database, but I think uh, we should treat this with caution because um, um, there are some, some issues with the unwinding of NDFs and currency swaps and the net enough of effect swaps that we actually use for liquidity purposes. So maybe we can actually, we, a, good, a good advice could be partitioning the sample or using this cross-sectional that you use at the end between the ones that intervene with derivatives and the ones that don't. Um, then I actually not very um, convinced of the panel strategy because I think uh, some of these effects are different in different countries. So maybe uh, using a time series regression by individual countries could actually help us well to understand if these misalignments are misalignments because this country behaves in a different way. And this comes from the central bank, like when, when this, we have these missions coming from the IMF we tried to convince them that we were a little bit different than the mo most FX inter interveners. So, so actually I think the central bank would welcome um, trying to find these be betas individually for this fundamental uh, step on the regression. Then, um, I'm not an expert in the metrics, but I think in the, in the estimation of the dynamic model, there might be some issues with the fixed effects. This is the famous uh, paper of Nickel, 1981. And in the calculation FX I surprises, um, as I mentioned, now we kind of understand that this volatility is endogenous to the, to the rules of intervention. So when you calculate the surprises, we use the contemporaneous uh, volatility of exchange rate, which I don't know if it's uh, actually will create endogeneity problems. So maybe using a lag or some longer measure. So these are just very specific comments. But just to conclude, I think this is a very relevant paper in the sense that it helps us understand um, in which cases FX intervention is effective. I think this novel dimension of calculating the deviations by frequency is not exclusive to this panel methodology. I think you can extend it to other papers or to other um, exercises. And I think doing it by, con by country will be actually useful. The results are pretty robust, and this is an appendix in the, in the paper that I really like, which talks about the historical view of FX intervention. And I think this is a very interesting point that the authors make. Um, they say that this FX intervention side guys has come full circle, and to me, it's actually um, a very valuable lesson in the sense of how my central bank, where I was working, actually believe always in this tool, and it has been, it's taken a long time to actually convince the academia that actually this tool can uh, improve the welfare of the country. So thank you very much for the paper. Thank you very much, Marco. Um,
We have a little bit of time. Let me just re respond very briefly to a few of your comments. Thank you for a very kind and thoughtful discussion. Um, first, let me make clear that this is not a normative paper, right? It's just about effective effectiveness, not about appropriateness or desirability of effect intervention. Um, I, I agree with you in the sense that we're still struggling a little bit with the uh, um, what we call short-term cycle, which is really one to four years. And if you think about theory, the factors that that may matter, um, so the shorter-term factors of uh, financial intermediaries, uh, market imperfections, imperfect uh, uh, hedging, uh, arbitrage opportunities, and so forth, they should probably show up at an sh even shorter frequency. And that's where you would expect uh, effects in intervention uh, to, to matter most. We, we, we don't look at that, but it's still interesting to see that we find it at a one to four year horizon. So it's something we, we are struggling ourselves a little bit with. On the nickel bias, I don't think it's an issue here because of the length of the time series. Uh, there, there are papers that show that if you approach certain numbers and we exceed them, uh, the nickel bias goes away. But uh, thank you very much for, for, your, for your discussion. Thanks for having me. Uh, this paper is joint work with Fabio Gironi from the University of Washington, and we basically ask whether interest rate uncertainty can be used as a capital management tool in an open economy. Starting with the colonial pattern of capital flows, emerging markets have been subject to ebbs and flows of capital constantly. This graph shows the portfolio flows into emerging markets from April 2006 to December 2013, and a common theme is the uh, is the increase in the size and the change in the direction of these capital inflows into emerging markets, especially after the advanced economy, uh, unconventional monetary policy. We see that after the expansionary policy, there is an inflow of uh, portfolio flows into emerging markets, where, uh, whereas like when there were uh, emer European Eurozone-like sovereign debt problems, we see a correlation with the risk in emerging markets. There's an outflow. And with the third round of quantitative easing, there is an inflow. With the Bernanke's taper signal, we also see an outflow. And if we extend this graph to a more uh, recent period, uh, this pattern also follows. So this, is, uh, this creates additional problems for the conduct of monetary policy in emerging markets, especially due to the pressure that it applies to inflation and exchange rate. So several emerging market economy, uh, central bankers introduced unconventional monetary policies to deal with the adverse effects of these capital flows. This is uh, one unconventional policy came from the Turkish central bank ex experience. And this graph shows the Turkish central bank's policy rate, which is the dashed black line, and uh, the corridor in which that this main policy rate fluctuates in between. So the unconventional policy from the Turkish Central Bank was in response to intense capital inflows, uh, we would like to make our policy rate, which is the one-week repo rate, more uncertain by widening the corridor uh, that, the, that the policy rate can fluctuate in between. And the corridor is determined by uh, overnight borrowing and lending rates. And in order to make, it, make the policy more certain, then the governor just communicated with white papers through the public by saying that if we widen the corridor, the policy rate will be more certain uh, for the future path of uh, policy. So what does this imply for the capital flows? The uh, argument behind the central bank's uh, policy was, if we make the policy more uncertain, it would discourage short-term inflows when there are ample liquidity in the financial markets, and we can still attract good ones like FDI and long-term ones. And, by widen, and if we need any short-term portfolio inflows, we can just widen the corridor, and we can also attract uh, sh short-term portfolio inflows into the emerging markets. The experiment coincides with the period that ends 2010 and uh, ends 2011. So it was just an 11-month exper experiment. Later on, there are some changes in corridor as well, but these are not related with the capital flow management experiment of the Turkish Central Bank. So against this background, Turkish Central Bank also shows some graphs about how, how, uh, what happened to capital flows or like what is the co-movement of capital flows with the 
uh, after the introduction of the policy mix. And from their graphs, like, they argue that uh, here, this graph shows the financement of the current account, whereas the blue line is the current account balance, and uh, the yellow bars show the FDI and long-term component of the financement of the current account, whereas the red bars show the portfolio in short term. And their argument is that after the introduction of the policy, like the interest rate cor corridor policy, there is an increase in the fraction of FDI financement vis-a-vis -vis portfolio inflows. Okay. But this graph shows with the, the pattern like that coincides with the global financial crisis, and it can be also due to mean reversion effects, and it doesn't say that much. And they didn't provide a rigorous analysis to uh, study the impact of such unconventional policy. So against this background, we basically ask, is using interest rate uncertainty as a policy tool is effective in dampening capital inflows? And if yes, uh, what is, does the interest rate uh, policy adjust the composition of capital inflows between the short-term ones, like portfolio inflows, and uh, long-term ones like FTI? And, and of course, like providing a framework that can provide answers to these two questions uh, lead to a, a third question, uh, what are the possible trade-offs that are faced by a central banker uh, while nav navigating among price stability and uh, controlling the external account. Because you can mess up with your main objectives of inflation targeting while you are targeting or controlling, trying to control the current account imbalances. So in order to answer these questions, first, we don't want this to be a, a Turkish central bank paper. So we would like to see, uh, see its impact like on overall, like several other emerging market economies. And, we use a VAR to plot estimated responses uh, to an identified uncertainty shock. So in, into our VAR, uh, overnight interest rate volatility goes in. We use real domestic uh, product, consumer price index, current account to GDP ratio, and net inflows to GDP ratio. So importantly, for the overnight interest rate volatility, we use overnight interest rate volatility for the interbank market rates. Because in the previous graph, as you see, like with the Turkish Central Bank's experiment, the policy rate hardly moved uh, when, the, when they widened the corridor, but whereas the overnight inter interbank rates started to fluctuate like massively within that corridor. And to distinguish between realized versus implied volatility, we use the interbank interest rate volatility in our VAR. Then the identification is uh, uh, by using a Cholosky decomposition. Uh, in which interest rate volatility is ordered first, very much like in Leduc and Louis uh, JME paper and Basu and Brundig's paper. So this implies that uh, uh, like vol volatility of the interest rate can have effect on uh, other variables, but uh, the other variables like do not, imp don't, do not have, imp have, have an uh, instantaneous impact on the volatility of the interbank interest rate. And then we build a new Keynesian open economy model like, uh, in, in which we can study uh, different types of capital flows and can experiment with higher order moments. So it, our model also crucially like, features incomplete international markets so that not net foreign assets are an important determinant for the transmission of shocks across the border. So when we talk about capital flows from the theoretical sense, we can talk about inefficient capital inflows, especially due to this incomplete international financial market setting, because inefficient uh, capital flows imply that the wealth is not efficiently distributed across the border due to incomplete uh, financial markets. There's no perfect risk sharing. And uh, the uh, movements of relative prices are not ex ante internalized by the agents across the border. So any shock that generates an inflow of capital into one region will be inefficient from the perspective of the home economy, and this would give incentive to the central banker to discourage these inflows. And of course, like in order to make the monetary policy effective, we have uh, price and wage rigidities. So you can think of our framework as a standard New Keynesian open economic framework that we can decompose uh, different types of capital flows, uh, but very much in line with the uh, standard papers of starting with the Opsfeld and Rogoff JP. And then what we add to this standard framework is that we employ a third order approximation uh, perturbation. Uh, we use a third order perturbation technique to solve the model in order to single out the effects of 
uh, transmission of stochastic volatility. And there are some technicalities related with impulse response calculation within this framework, which is already established in closed economy models. But due to time constraints, like I'm not going to go into details, but the punchline is from the standard open economy new Keynesian framework, we distinguish by introducing different types of capital flows and by introducing nonlinearities and so uh, a model solution that accounts for nonlinearities. So what do we learn? <clears throat> Interest rate uncertainty policy can be effective in tackling inefficient capital inflows. First of all, uh, there is a wedge on the perfect risk sharing condition due to this imperfect, uh, due to this incomplete international financial market assumption. And this wedge moves opposite, in opposite directions in response to capital inflows and after the introduction of interest rate uncertainty policy in the emerging market economy. So it implies that instead of dampening the wedge, like dampening the inefficiencies, the wedge can move in opposite directions and can be offset, uh, and, uh, and the policy can be used against inefficient inflows. Second, the, the uncertainty policy has different implications on bond and FDI components of the cap uh, capital account. Uh, portfolio risk and consumption smoothing channels will be very much related with the bond component, which will affect uh, the capital flows on Short, short, on the short-term component, and the markup channel will be mainly re related with the FTI component of the current account. So in the end, we conclude that using interest rate uncertainty as a policy tool might be useful in adjusting the current account, but it will always come at the expense of higher inflation. So it is a question left to the central bankers whether it is good to deviate from the main policy objective of inflation targeting uh, for the objective of controlling external account. We also have several extensions uh, in our paper that I'm not going to discuss in this presentation, but I just would like to uh, highlight uh, our extensions. So we have extensions uh, for the cases in which, like, if, there is, if the time required to conduct FTI is getting longer, then we see also wait and see effects in response to rising uncertainty, like very much in line with Bernanke's 1983 QJ paper, like uh, highlighting the options value of investment because agents would like to wait and see until the resolution of uncertainty when investment takes longer to complete. The currency of export invoicing is crucial in this setting. So our baseline scenario assumes dominant currency pricing by assuming emerging markets price their exports in the rest of the world currency, but rest of the world agents price their exports in their own currency. And when we deviate from this DCP framework or even from LCP for a local currency pricing to producer currency pricing, we see that the behavior of FDI changes qualitatively, not only quantitatively. And I will also talk uh, a bit about that. And also risk aversion of foreign uh, agents, like when we introduce or with an extension of Epstein's and whale preferences, for example, it also amplifies our results. And we have some welfare results in the paper as well, which I'm not going to discuss in this presentation, but uh, it is possible that interest rate uncertainty policy can be welfare improving under certain conditions, especially in response to preference shocks and monetary policy, shock, uh, monetary policy shocks. And this is kind of counterintuitive to our understanding that uncertainty is always welfare decreasing. So first of all, the results from the VAR. So in response to a 1% increase in interbank interest rate volatility. I'm just showing impulse responses for Turkey, Brazil, Indonesia, and Korea for real GDP, CPI, current account to GDP, and net foreign FDI flows to GDP ratios. So overall, like we see that in response to one standard uh, deviation increase in interbank interest rate uncertainty, real GDP falls in, uh, in these four countries we see an increase, we observe an increase in the CPI, like indicated for the inflationary effects of this uncertainty shock. And the current account corrects itself, in Turkey especially, uh, in Brazil and also in Korea. The effects are a bit more ambiguous in Indonesia. But an increase in the current account implies capital outflows. So the current account deficits get smaller, so the financement of the current account gets narrower. It, it's an implication of the capital outflow. But at the same time, when we look at the FDI component of the financement of the current account, we see an increase for the Turkish case. Uh, for example, in response to an increase in interest rate uncertainty, 
Also in Indonesia, we see this increase, and in Brazil, uh, an increase after four periods. And the effects are more ambiguous in Korea, but on average, we can argue that like B2 is in the eye of the beholder, of course, but we conclude like with the, also uh, with several, several other countries uh, in our paper, like in addition to these four countries, an, in, an increase in interest rate uncertainty generates a fallen GDP, an increase in inflation, capital outflows, but on the uh, component other than the FDI portion of the capital inflows, and because uh, it might generate an inflow of capital into the emerging economy, at least for these. Then switching to model, uh, as I said, like this is very much in line with the Opsfeld and Rogoff tradition with uh, two uh, differences. The first one is that rest of the world agents and also emerging market economy agents have the option to invest in physical capital that will be rented to overseas production functions in addition to invest in physical capital that will be used in uh, domestic production function. This is what we call FDI, in addition to bond flows, because it's, uh, it, it consists of the physical capital investment and uh, tangible investment uh, in, or, or, uh, conducted overseas. International financial markets are incomplete. There is an international bond for each country that is traded across the border. And final goods uh, are an Armington aggregator of the domestically produced goods and the internationally produced goods. Uh, here, the deviations from purchasing power parity is due to home bias uh, in consumption also. So just I will show you very briefly some model elements. I, I won't show you everything, but uh, these will be important to pin down uh, uh, what we are doing, to say what we are doing. So the preferences are GHH to abstract from the wealth effects. And we augment the preferences with a preference shock that follows a second order component, which is a stochastic volatility uh, component. So here, this shock does not hit the emerging market economy, but this is what we, when th this shock hits the rest of the world when we generate capital inflows into the emerging market economy. So when there is a demand shock or uh, an uncertainty about demand in the rest of the world, there are capital flows coming from the foreign economy to the home economy in this case. Just to show you the portfolio problem of the households, so households can, on the expenditure side, there is consumption, but they can save in domestic bonds and they can save in uh, for the rest of the world or international bonds, where S is the exchange rate here. And they can invest in physical capital that will be used in their own production function. And they can invest in physical capital that will be used in overseas production function. So this is the outgoing FTI, if you think this as the emerging market economy. And this is the international borrowing or international saving of the home economy, depending on the sign of the uh, bond variable. And on the income side, there are relative returns coming from each type of investment. Other constraints are standard, so I'm not going over them, but just to highlight that there are no adjustment costs that can generate fluctuations in prices, but we will have fluctuations in prices due to another reason, because when we account for the international trade of physical capital, the price of physical capital that is installed abroad is directly linked with the real exchange rate. Especially, like this is for the outgoing FTI, and this is for the incoming FTI from the rest of the world. So the physical capital's price, like for, for the international agents, fluctuates inversely with the uh, real exchange rate. If the real exchange rate depreciates, increases from the emerging market economy perspective or the home perspective, it implies a decrease in the price of home physical capital or the incoming FTI into the emerging market economy. And the Euler equation related with the capital investment decisions is also related uh, with the fluctuations in exchange rate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, finally, the monetary authority. So the interest rate uncertainty policy. There is a Taylor rule that is uh, being followed by the emerging market economy central banker, but uh, this is a rules-based policy. And in order to capture the components which are not related with the rules-based, when there are deviations from the rules-based policy, for example, under intense capital inflows, it is not usually like possible for the emerging market economy central bankers to stick to their framework. 
and they can move the interest rate or the other policy, uh, the, the other, other to, to respond to other variables which are not uh, defined in their mandate, like the Turkish case, for example. And this, uh, we, we use this disturbance component, the additional component, in order to capture the additional responses of the interest rate to deviations from the rules-based policy. Importantly, this deviation component has a stochastic volatility for the shock that it hits, but the stochastic volatility is based on a rule which responds to changes in uh, rest of the world demand uncertainty or rest of the world second order preference shock. But it doesn't have to be defined this way, like we have also cases like in which this interest rate uncertainty also responds to, for example, directly the level of the preference shocks that are coming to the rest of the world or directly to the capital inflows as well. But f for now, like I'm going to show you results coming from this policy rule. Just as an intermediate step uh, before switching to results, what I meant by uh, inefficient capital inflows and imperfect risk sharing. So when we uh, look at the ratio of, uh, so incomplete markets induce uh, imperfect risk sharing across the border in terms of marginal utilities from the consumption. So if it was a complete market framework, this wage, mu UIP, would be equal to one and there would be perfect risk sharing. So due to incomplete markets, we have this time varying uh, wedge over the perfect risk trading condition. And in response to capital inflows, this wedge will move into one direction. And if the policy, interest rate uncertainty policy, is effective in uh, closing this wedge or uh, answering to the inefficient capital inflows, this wedge is expected to move in the opposite direction in order to be effective for the uh, imperfect risk sharing friction, at least. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I would like to show you some results. Here are the impulse responses generated from first an inflow of capital into the emerging market economy, which is uh, indicated by the purple line here, the rest of the world preference stochastic volatility shock. So when there is demand uncertainty in the rest of the world, there is an inflow of capital, which is being reflected as uh, the current account deficit in the bond component of the emerging market economy, the purple line which boosts consumption in the emerging market economy and which boosts output in the emerging market economy. So, and then we introduce interest rate uncertainty policy in the emerging market economy with changing the response parameter from five to 15, just to show you the policy rule again. So we are in increasing the response parameter to the rest of the world capital inflows. And we see that as, as the response is getting increasing to the international uh, uncertainty, or uh, most people just calibrated with VIX, for example, in, uh, in the literature. So we first see there is a correction in the international risk sharing wedge. So the, in, so the risk sharing is getting better as we increase the response of interest rate uncertainty. But uh, it is not only helping the international risk sharing wedge, it is also helping the correction in the wage markup, the wage, uh, because we have sticky wages in this case. In the, in the baseline setting. It corrects the uh, time varying markup on the uh, wages, but it worsens the price, price markups, both uh, domestic prices and export prices. Importantly, export price markups go down, whereas the domestic price markups go up, which is indicated for the inflationary effect. But we also see that both types of uncertainty uh, increase, uh, sorry, uh, when we increase the interest rate uncertainty, like there is a fall in consumption vis-a-vis -vis the pure capital inflow case, and this fall in consumption is indicated for the consumption smoothing and also precautionary saving effects. So where do these savings go? They do not go into uh, outside, but they do go into investment. So they are not going into short-term flows, and when we look at the response of the current account, we see an inflow of also uh, investment into the emerging market economy while there is a discouragement in the bond component of the current account. As I mentioned before, like the price of capital is linked with exchange rate. In this case, interest rate uncertainty depreciates real exchange rate. Exchange rate depreciates, price of capital uh, decreases in the emerging market economy, 
So FTI is bringing more returns, and it generates an inflow of FTIs. The decrease in export price markup is crucial. If you can give me just one more minute, I will just talk about that and uh, finish it. So in the closed economy case, for example, the blue line, if we plot the period profits to relative prices, we see that profits are asymmetric in the sense that it is always a precautionary pricing motive to increase prices in response to uncertainty in the closed economy models of Fernandez, Villaverde, and others. But when we introduce the exchange rate as a third dimension here in the different colors, under dominant currency pricing, this asymmetricity changes. For example, for uh, exchange rate depreciating, it becomes optimal to decrease prices in response to uncertainty, whereas in the closed economy case, it was optimal to increase prices in response to uncertainty. And uh, due to this behavior, firms decrease their markups in response to uncertainty and demand more inputs, including FDI coming from the rest of the world. And this is the main impact like, that generates the FDI coming into the emerging market economy. And this is uh, qualitatively different from the closed economy cases. Anyways, I will stop here because I'm running out of time. Uh, we have lots of other cases in the paper if you're interested, thanks to the referees. Uh, and <laughs> uh, any questions, I, I will be more than happy to answer. Thanks very much. So. Um this is, I, I would not be uh, telling something new. This is a very interesting paper. I enjoyed reading it. Um, um, the most enjoyable part for me was the one that, were, that you mentioned as one line at the bottom of a slide somewhere. It can be well for improving, because it's, it's quite unusual, as you mentioned. Uh, we learned that uncertainty is welfare decreasing normally. Uh, you find that it is improving, and uh, I was trying to understand what exactly is happening in, in, in the model. And that's, um, there are many positive things that you told us about uh, interest rate uncertainty as a policy tool. It discourages foreign investment. So there are many channels that um, make it plausible, but there may be something beneficial about it. But uh, the welfare improvement, I couldn't quite understand why. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's a little bit. Uh, and um, yeah, that's something that that's, that's, um, I, I would like to, to, to discuss more. So what, what do we know about uncertainty? And um, what do central banks do now about uncertainty? We, we used to have a period of constructive ambiguity in central banking. So we used to have policy of not informing about central bank policy. Uh, with the idea that unexpected policy shocks will uh, lead to uh, GDP growth and uh, welfare improvement. Uh, central banks have abandoned this world for, for some reason. Um, and uh, currently, they increase transparency. Um, uh, I thought that maybe that's all old literature, but I was able to find papers from uh, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and there are more. So people still continue to tell us that Uncertainty is not, is not very good. Um, so um, the question that is, was to me central is to understand why in your context, if we believe in the simulation exercises, because if it's not a random error, that is slight, just happens to be slightly positive in terms of welfare improve, improvement, what exactly is the channel for that, for that welfare improvement? And um, uh, because the model is a little bit complex, it's quite difficult to understand what exactly is happening there. You've identified three channels. Um, I can understand how they work in terms of current account improvement. I can understand why they are inflationary, but I still find it a bit difficult to reconcile why an inflationary policy, a policy that is always inflationary, can in the end be welfare improving. So that's, that, that, was, that was probably um, the most difficult part. Then I was thinking, OK, so what do we have in the model? We have uh, the important component of the model is the foreign investment. And the foreign investment is stochastic. So there is already one source of uncertainty. One idea that potentially to look at would be to see whether the new source of uncertainty that you create 
by introducing also interest rate uncertainty somehow offsets the uncertainty that you already have in the model and through that reason, uh, but, 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 that, but that channel uh, improves welfare. You've mentioned um, a reduction in, in, in the wedge. From the very beginning, the wedge was defined as a uh, um, uh, measure of incompleteness of markets. The way I see incompleteness of markets is that, for example, the states of nature that are realizable in one country do not, are not observable in the other country. That's why perfect hedging between the two countries is impossible. That's one of the ways how I usually understood the wedge. The new policy, the policy and the interest rate uncertainty doesn't reduce or doesn't increase or doesn't improve observability of states of nature. Because especially in the model, it is linked to the uncertainty of foreign investment. So maybe the reduction of the wedge is just uh, the consequence of a reduction of foreign capital inflow. And because there is less, interna less international flows of capital, the wage reduces. But the reason, the fundamental reasons for the wage is still there. So that's something I would want to look into that. The other reason, potential reason for potential justification for interest rate uncertainty is to avoid uh, unnecessary restrictions on fluctuations of interest rates. And that's something that the chairman of the Canadian Central Bank actually was when, when, when he was, or he, he it's, it's, it's a man, yeah? <laughs> was citing your paper, I read this speech, and that's quite a neat idea. We don't want to restrict markets too much, and when we see that there is volatility coming, we should actually uh, free up and avoid artificial restriction on, on, on price fluctuations. That could make sense. That if that uncertainty, if, if introducing interest rate uncertainty removes unnecessary restrictions from um, from, uh, from, from the market. The way you model it, um, uh, if, if I understood it correctly, you do not model the corridor, although it was inspired by the uh, Turkish corridor. Um, you introduce a shock to Taylor rule. You justify it by discretion. Mm, I don't know how exactly you can communicate discretion of a stochastic nature to, to the public. So if you want to inform the public about um, interest rate uncertainty as a policy tool, and we as a central bank, we would need to inform the public about our policy with that respect. How can I say, okay, my policy will be very stochastic. <laughs> the interest rate will be stochastic. And if it is discretion, discretion means um, from time to time changes. It doesn't mean that I have a rule to improve, to increase stochasticity, volatility of my interest rate in response to external volatility. Maybe you should look for a different example there because I don't, I don't want to discard the, the very idea of having um, a shocks to the policy uh, rates that you have in the model. I think that the idea is, theoretically the idea is quite interesting. But it is not that well linked to the leading example of corridor in, uh, in Turkey. And um, I struggle a little bit to digest what it could be. So how we should uh, interpret the shocks to the, to, to the policy rate. Um, so that's uh, corridors, corridors are, uh, um, um, corridors exist. They exist uh, in different ways in different countries. What I wanted to show with this slide is that it takes two to tango. It's not only the interest rate uncertainty. If, you, if we talk about corridors, it's not only expanding the corridor that, that matters. It's also how the market perceives it. So if you have the market that believes that there is huge uncertainty and you narrow down the corridor, of, of course it has a, an impact. If you expand the corridor but the market believes, ah, oh, no, there is no uncertainty. And in your first chart you have shown that the rates didn't actually, it's only the one the green line fluctuated and went slightly down to, to, to the expanded corridor. But then I'm coming back to the discussion, is the policy uncertainty being introduced because we anticipate market fluctuations and we expand the corridor to allow for that, to remove restriction, then there is an indigeneity uh, issue. So we sort of respond to our anticipated volatility. In that sense, it can be policy improving, but the way you model policy uncertainty in the model is not exactly the corridor. It's something different. 
So that's um, my uh, main concern, concern with that. And um, um, yeah, there are some, some tiny comments. I'll just, just leave it here. One of them, this, this is the most, the most recent example from, from, from real life because you assume that everything is being paid in, the, uh, in dollars in your model. And then what, what would change? But this, these are minor comments. So I'll just leave, the, leave them on the slide. To me, maybe the most important question is uh, the uh, local improvement through policy uncertainty. So that's, I don't want to be too long. <laughs>
to make statements about the granular origin of microeconomic fluctuations. So just a quick preview of my findings. Um, I find that a widening of credit spreads leads to ca net capital inflows, suggesting that it is the higher return um, on investment that investors can earn, maybe the growth prospects in the country that attract foreign capital. I do also find tentative evidence that suggests that um, higher credit spreads are associated with capital outflows precisely during large currency depreciations um, and after prolonged periods of credit risk building up over time. So this goes back to the idea that I mo motivated initially that as um, currency mismatch on corporate balance sheets gets exacerbated by large currency swings, their default risk increases and this may make investors grow cautious about the risks in these markets and pull out. So in response to 100 basis point cred adverse credit risk shock, um, capital flow out of the economy, the terms of trade deteriorate, industrial production falls by down to six percentage points, and the unemployment rate rises by up to 1.3 percentage points over a two-year horizon. So this evidence has suggested that um, corporate credit risk could potentially amplify business cycle fluctuations with quantitatively quite sizable uh, real consequences in emerging market economies. Um, and I think that my paper is an important laboratory also to test Gabel's granular hypothesis, namely the idea that aggregate fluctuations originate really in the behavior of a handful of large players. But to make things a bit more concrete, um, let's suppose capital flow F of country C at time T are linear related to a country's aggregate credit spread S, a set of country controls X, and a country-specific shock eta where um, the uh, aggregate credit spread is some weighted average of firm J's individual credit spreads. And let's further suppose that a firm J's individual credit spread is subject to a common shock that hits all firms equally and an idiosyncratic firm specific shock. And we make the strong assumption here that this idiosyncratic shock is exogenous with respect to the common shock eta and to the country level shock um, epsilon. Now, note that we cannot simply recover the alpha, the elasticity of capital flows with respect to credit risk from that regression using OLS, because it is likely that the country-specific shock is going to be correlated with that common shock that hits firms. And so we need an instrument for that um, aggregate credit spread. And this is where the granular instrumental variable comes in, which is essentially just a summary statistic of all of these supposedly exogenous firm-specific shocks. And I'll con try to convince you in a second that this makes sense. So you may wonder now, how do we get these firm-specific shocks, right? Um, so the literature has proposed mostly a principal component analysis um, to uh, um, decompose um, credit spreads into some K principal components and then use the remaining variation um, as idiosyncratic risk. Now, because my um, bond firm country panel is highly unbalanced, I've so far refrained from using PCA and instead have a opted for a more explicit approach that follows Fierkris and Sakrisek's uh, canonical paper that decomposes credit spreads into a fundamental component that represents um, expected default risk of firms and a non-fundamental component that is driven by market sentiment. But of course, I augment their um, method, uh, which is for US firms, to an international context. So I stipulate that um, the credit spread paid on bond K of firm J in country C at time T is linearly related to the expected default frequency of the firm, a measure of the probability of default of that firm, a set of liquidity risk characteristics that are bond specific. So this is a, a regression at the bond level. Um, global risk factors such as the VIX and the 10-year US Treasury yield, as well as country fixed effects and industry fixed effects. And I argued that um, what is remaining is truly idiosyncratic firm-specific uh, variation in credit spreads. And subject to you being somewhat convinced that this is, uh, could be likely the case, we can then proceed um, by constructing the granular instrumental variable as simply the difference between the share-weighted sums of idiosyncratic shocks and the equally-weighted sum of idiosyncratic shocks. And what that difference intuitively does is it picks up all the variation that is due to particularly large firms, granular firms, that cannot be explained by the average firm. And so it provides an additional step in case in the previous regression, our idiosyncratic shock 
component may still capture some systematic variation that is not captured by the specification that affects all firms, that additional step here sort of purges off that common variation. And also note that it represents an aggregation step where we move from the firm level to the country level to construct a country level instrument. Um, importantly, the share um, in the, so the weight uh, used to compute the GIV must represent the firm's position and the firm size distribution. So showing that uh, these firms are more granular with respect to other firms. So I use um, the debt as a share of total debt to signify the debt at risk that investors may care about. Um, and we can then proceed by using that instrument in the usual two-stage least squares fashion where we instrument the credit spread in the first stage and then use the fitted uh, values from the second stage. Um, so, of course, we need, need to ask, uh, is that instrument valid? Well, it is relevant because um, these idiosyncratic shocks explain a large variation in the credit spreads and thereby also capital flows. Um, if the previous step convinced you, we can assume that the exogeneity condition may hold. Now the exclusion restriction. So it needs to be the case that these GIVs, these granular IVs, affect capital flows only via the credit spread and not via some other latent factor not captured in the model. And I argue that this is likely to be the case because the credit spread is really a summary statistic of all of the available information to investors to make their investment decision um, in, in emerging markets. Um, so coming to the data, um, just very quickly, I use weekly data on option-adjusted spreads uh, and bond details, which I retrieve from Bloomberg. Um, so after cleaning and merging, I obtain a sample of about 3,200 bonds that I match with firm-level information from these credit edge on expected default frequencies um, and quarterly balance sheet information from Bloomberg. Um, so I arrive at a sample of about 800 publicly listed non-financial firms. Um, and I also match um, Importantly, I also match uh, bonds that are issued offshore via offshore subsidiaries um, to domestic parent companies. Um, so I also obtain bonds from, from tax havens. Um, with respect to the capital flow measure, I use weekly port net portfolio flows of EPFR Global, which have the advantage that they're available at a weekly frequency um, and that I can single out flows into hard currency markets because I, most, I only focus on US dollar denominated debt. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that it represents only net portfolio flows and we can discuss later um, what that also means to the implications of, of the results. Um, and then finally, of course, some global factors um, and country level variables. Now, as I already mentioned, what is important for this identification approach to work is that these firms are really granular, so that they, um, the, that they take up a large share of economic activity. And what we can see here is that large firms really form the bulk of a country's market cap, um, looking at the largest 20th um, decile, uh, percentile by total assets. Uh, and this was also confirmed in separate work by Laura, Laura Alfaro and co-authors. So emerging market borrowers are really large, large firms on average. Um, and for the um, strength of the instrument, we also need to have sufficient heterogeneity in, um, in the, the credit spreads um, for the instrument to be sufficiently strong. So here I plotted um, each firm's credit spread against the size of the firm measured by total assets um, and scaled by the volume of, of the bond. So we can see that smaller firms on average pay um, much higher um, funding costs, whereas larger firms um, pay uh, less funding costs. They have experienced less funding costs. So this uh, provides some um, degree of confidence that um, the sample is sufficiently heterogeneous. Um, now coming to the first level um, results, as I, as I mentioned, I first start by decomposing credit spreads to uh, extract firm-specific shocks. Um, and so here, a number of observations are interesting. Um, so first of all, the uh, expected default frequency, so the probability of default of the firm, um, is highly significant in explaining credit spreads, um, which is in line with what we find for US firms as well. So a one percentage point increase in the probability of default of a firm demands a 72 basis point higher credit spread. And this explains about 20% of the variance uh, in observed credit spreads.
Um, note also that, for example, the VIX, um, as a measure of um, global risk aversion, actually um, is, not, is a significant predictor, but not that strong, and also takes only a very small percent uh, in the variance decomposition. Um, but the remaining variation, so the idiosyncratic shocks that we care about, still take up about 70% of, of the variance in, in credit spreads. And this is in line with uh, what we can also find for, um, for US firms in the same type of model um, employed by Greg Christian Jack Reisig. Um, so this, this also implies that, of course, we have enough variation in, we, we don't already filter everything out here, but we still have enough variation in the firm-specific shocks. Um, now, one exercise that is um, very instructive is to uh, simply aggregate all of these firm-specific shocks across all bonds and firms across all countries to arrive at um, a so-called emerging market excess bond premium. So the pendant to the U.S. excess bond premium found by Gilchrist and Sakrisic and plot these uh, next to each other. And we can see that there's um, quite some correlation up until the global financial crisis um, of 60%, but over the past decade, that correlation um, has broken down to about only 20 percentage points. Um, and so this is a, quite a novel stylized fact that um, I find very interesting, haven't had the time yet to explore, but that um, first of all means that we don't just have some latent factors that drive both U.S. bond and uh, emerging bond markets. And um, that could, for example, um, be related back to shifts in the architecture of global banks and the rise in non-bank financial intermediation. So this is something worth exploring uh, going forward. But coming out to the country panel regressions, um, so in the first stage, I'm showing you here the OLS results um, of just running a regression of um, the portfolio flow measure on the credit spread, um, a set of um, domestic um, controls and controls for global factors without instrumenting the credit spread. And we can clearly see it that the um, credit spread measure is insignificant, whereas global factors clearly dominate uh, in this regression. But when instrumenting the credit spread measure with the GIV, we do find a a significant positive effect, suggesting that a widening of credit spreads attracts capital from abroad. And, and this holds up to you know, the usual statistics, so um, there's no concern about weak instruments or under-identification, and the first stage coefficient on the GIV is also highly statistically significant. Now we may wonder what causes that downward bias in the OLS estimate. It could be precisely because we're not accounting for the strong effect of, of risk offshocks that, that uh, are correlated with the spread that push down that, that estimate. Um, but we're accounting for that variation once instrumenting with the GIV. Um, now to further shed light on potential asymmetries between capital inflows versus net capital outflows, um, I also run an augmented version of the two-stage least squares regression where I um, augment the model with an interaction term for large currency depreciations. So again, I hypothesize that during normal times, tranquil times, um, a rise in, um, in, in credit risk attracts foreign capital and search for higher yield, but during large currency depreciations, currency mismatch on corporate balance sheets gets exacerbated um, and therefore maybe leads investors to um, reprice the risk in these markets and pull out. Um, and here I, I do find a tentative evidence of an asymmetric effect, and I'm saying tentative and really qualify that because of course I'm aware that these large currency depreciations are in and of itself endogenous to, to a capital flow measure, so I don't take this at face value. Um, but going forward, what I would like to do is um, to obtain um, an exogenous measure of uh, foreign exchange rate shocks, high frequency foreign exchange rate shocks, for example, through um, in, international investors, um, local demand for local currency debt, and to identify this more clearly. Um, and finally, how many minutes do I have left? Two, okay. And finally, um, as I motivated at the beginning, um, canonical models of sudden stops and capital flow reversals really suggest that um, these sudden stops are preceded by prolonged periods of credit risk building up over time and leverage rising in the domestic economy. And they suggest that the impact of, of the reversals is, is quantitatively quite sizable. 
So what I do as a final step, I um, employ a dynamic local projections um, panel framework where I instrument the cumulative um, credit spread measure with the, GI, with the cumulative GIV and following um, Ramey and Suberi, so I um, interpret the cumulative term as sort of credit risk building up over time domestically um, and assess its impact on, um, on capital flows and uh, macroeconomic activity at a monthly frequency here. And what I find is that in response to a 100 basis point shock, uh, widening of, of credit spreads, capital flow out of the economy um, by up to 250 million on average over two years, uh, US dollars. The terms of trade deteriorate gradually, industrial production falls by down to six percentage points, and the unemployment rate rises by up to 1.3 percentage points over the course of two years. So this suggests that um, credit risk can have quite sizable business cycle uh, implications. Um, and then finally, um, there's of course the usual threats to instrument validity, um, for example, that the exogeneity condition of the GIV doesn't hold. Well, I tried to convince you that really at three different steps in the empirical approach, I tried to control for these strong global push factors, um, namely in the decomposition, in the very construction of the GIV, and in the country panel regressions. So um, at least these, you know, the global financial cycle should hopefully not be captured and they're in anymore and confound results. Um, and uh, a, a common um, criticism of the GIV approach is also that these weights in the construction of the GIV are in endogenous um, with respect to what's going on. So one remedy is to lag the weights, but of course um, future research will need to look more into um, finding alternative weights. Um, I already mentioned the FX depreciations in general, there's a few robustness checks that the results hold up to, for example, controlling for EM sovereign risk and um, oil prices, but there's a lot more to do still, and I'm sure that Egerman will have a lot of comments on that as well. Um, and of course, the big problem here is also that I'm using net capital, net portfolio flows, so I'm not taking into account to what extent there is domestic retrenchment of capital um, during crisis times, um, but yeah, uh, I this is still a work in progress, so happy to receive any comments on that as well. So summing up, um, in this paper, I construct a rich uh, bond firm country panel data set that spans the universe of US dollar denominated corporate bonds, not local currency corporate bonds, um, in a set of emerging markets and matched to the tax havens as well. Um, I decompose these credit spreads into various risk components to extract firm specific shocks that I use to construct granular instrumental variables for identification. Um, and my results suggest that domestic credit risk uh, may amplify business cycle fluctuations with um, uh, quantitatively sizable implications for emerging markets that are vulnerable to, to these adverse consequences. So summing up, just the two things that I would like you to take away from this is that domestic pull factors do seem to matter even after controlling for these powerful global push factors. And there's tentative evidence that they may not only matter for capital inflows, but also for capital outflows. Thank you. Okay, it's the third time you're seeing me. I hope you're not sick of it. <laughs> third presentation of the conference, second discussion of the day. So um, let me just go into the discussion. So this is, the questions are very clear. What she does is extremely clear. And all, all I have to say is positive. I'll have some um, concerns about the identification, which she discusses all of the threats to identification in a lot of detail. I'll just have three additional ones that might actually affect, and then I'll uh, finish in a good note as well. So the questions in the paper, it's uh, very well defined. She asks, does, corporate domestic, does domestic corporate uh, credit risk affect capital flows in emerging markets? And then does a buildup of corporate credit risk later uh, lead to reversals? Um, it's a very hard question to answer because there's reverse causality. Uh, there, there could be uh, credit spreads because capital flows themselves affect the credit spreads or capital flows could be reacting to credit spreads in the emerging markets and it's a very hard that, that task to deal with them. So the question is, can we isolate the pull factors from the push factors? 
And uh, what Tatiana uh, says, argues, is that uh, we can use the firm size distribution and the granular instrumental variables approach to actually identify the, uh, the pull factors. So I'll have some questions about the validity of the instrument, but just, just to make it clear, this is, it's a very hard question, and uh, it's extremely original and very well written. And I think it's really, like, if you're teaching students capital flows, this should be on your reading list in the international finance syllabus. It just summarizes everything really well. And, and what I like the most is she just talks about all the things that are a threat to her identification, and that just is a very nice learning opportunity for any student in international finance. So that said, uh, let me just summarize how the granular IV approach works. Uh, in words, she explained it very nicely in uh, equations. So basically what we have is there's a firm size distribution, if you take the GABEX 2011 idea, and then shifts in credit risk that are idiosyncratic to large players will affect macro outcomes, is the hope. And basically the way you get at that is you, I, you try to isolate the idiosyncratic firm shocks from by stripping out any country risk or any global factors. And uh, if some firms are large enough, then you will have firm-specific risks that will aggregate. That is, not, that is not the common shock that is applying to all the average firms. But these shocks are large enough because the firms are large enough so that uh, the idiosyncratic risks cannot be diversified and they will be systemic. And it will influence the perceptions of uh, investors of the economy-wide risks. So that's kind of the idea. And then it, you can then generate uh, an instrumental variable that will summarize the credit risk of particularly large firms that is not explained by the average firm. And this will work, for example, as long as sovereign risk, for example, affects all firms equally. If that is the case, or anything else that affects all the firms equally, then this is a good instrument. But then I'll try to argue that that's a big if. And, uh, just one paper that I was thinking about all the interactions of sovereign risk and credit risk, which was uh, corporate risk, which was not cited in the paper, which could be very relevant, is uh, Van Shindu and Jesse Schrager. They have, a, I think, RFS paper that basically shows the linkages between sovereign and corporate risk that I think might have distributional effects as well. So the idea is, if you look at the heterogeneity in the private sector, so the main point of the paper is just because the sovereign is borrowing in local currency doesn't mean that corporate foreign currency borrowing doesn't affect the sovereign's decision or the sovereign's default risk. And what they do is they look at the heterogeneity in the foreign currency uh, exposure of the private sector, and then they show that that explains sovereign's uh, uh, default risk across countries and time. And why is this important? Because the, the argument they have is uh, if the private sector has foreign currency debt, the sovereign will take into account the impact of the local currency inflation on the impact on the private sector. And why is this relevant for your case? Big players are going to be reflected in the sovereign's decision more likely because they are potentially too big to fail or too big to have a debt overhang, etc. So in that sense, the sovereign risk may not affect the, and all, all the firms equally. And so you try a lot. Uh, to isolate the so sovereign effect. So one thing uh, she does is she controls for government uh, state-owned companies, but I think this argument would be beyond that. So this is something to take into account, and uh, that would actually threaten the validity of the instrument. So other two thoughts is, uh, so what happens? So everything we try to do is we try to have a, a, an instrumental variable that only uh, is affected by the pull factors. But I can think of two possible cases as well why capital flows still might have an effect. One of them is what happens if investors just cannot buy the entire set of portfolios in a country, but they just create proxy exposures by just buying the, the large firms. So any shock to the investors then will be reflected as an idiosyncratic shock because the average firms will not be affected. The investors' shocks will be showing up in the, in the, in the pricing of the large firms. Also, the weights also would be dependent on the, uh, the, the weights that enter the IV would probably also enter the, the weights of the investor portfolio. So that's potentially a concern as well. But you could try to look at that 
to see if in bond, port, uh, bond funds portfolios if you see anything like this. Or, so that could be something that you could look at. Another thing is we only have the, the bonds. We don't have the loans. It could be a possibility that the big players, they are in the syndicated long loan market, and then there are shocks to banks in the syndicated loan market, and then that means these firms then have to go to the bond market, and then that somehow affects the, the pricing of these bonds, and that might also be a threat to, to identification. And then, so one thing also that is related to this, which would actually try to capture all the bank-related effects, but also I think it's related to the global financial cycle controls is I haven't seen the broad dollar index as a control, UIP deviations as a control, CIP deviations as a control. So those I think are very relevant, but they are not currently in the construction of the instrument. But let me leave on a positive note. So she also suggested that this, this picture to me was also very interesting because not only because it shows that this, there, there are some things that are unexplained about the post-GFC world, that maybe there are some pull factors that are being more important now, but also I've seen this result of pull factors being more important in various other places as well that suggest to me, and they're looking at very different data. So CGFS report on capital flows, for example, has the same, same kind of finding after uh, post-GFC. I think for, uh, Forbes Varnock paper the recent one also has something to this extent. So it's, it's encouraging that we see this, and I think you could do a lot more on this. But then I had a question about the, co the construction, like there's a drop during COVID, I didn't really understand why. So I think if you go this route of taking this and trying to explain stuff, I think that could be useful. Yeah, so the sort of disadvantage of the uh, EPFR measure that I'm using is that uh, it's basically just uh, changes in country allocations by funds. They also have more granular data, which at the time that I wrote this paper, um, did not have access to. Um, so I bought the EPFR data. Um, but going forward, and this also relates to what, what uh, Igeman said about um, you know, looking more into how these large investors actually behave and how they use uh, large firms as, um, as proxies, um, that could be tackled with more granular data. And this is available, I think, um, through EPFR at the fund level even. So, yeah. Um, I think with more granular data in general, um, a, lot of, a lot of the open questions here will hopefully also be able to be tackled, yeah. Okay, um, so first of all, thank you so much, Igeman. Uh, really, really helpful. Um, do and Trega, uh, you're right, I did not cite that. I will definitely look into it. And um, yes, there are also point well taken that they, there are also spillovers from corporate to sovereign uh, sovereigns that do not only go via state-owned enterprises, um, for sure. Um, yeah, point on, on large investors, uh, well taken, subject to, to better data and more granular data. Um, the substitution effect between loan and bond markets, yeah, I also thought about that. Obviously, I cannot capture the, the syndicated loan market and what is going on there. Um, I would imagine that, um, and I think I read this somewhere, there was some evidence that emerging market firms tend to borrow more long-term via bond markets and more short-term via syndicated loan markets. And then there's also differences in, um, in size depending on how big these corporate borrowers are. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, point well taken that I'm not controlling for these syndicated loan markets. There, there may be substitution effects. Um, the CGFS report, yeah, that was also a source of inspiration for that uh, interpretation of the ex emerging market excess bond premium. And um, drop in COVID, I really have to investigate, yeah. Um, I think it may also be related to the uh, use of the option adjusted spread, um, which is a bit more volatile than observed spreads because uh, it results from like a, a model that takes into account optionality in some of the bonds. Um, and so sometimes there's like, like big drops in, uh, in these spreads related to those options when they are called. So that may be related to that, but I'll definitely investigate. Thank you so much.